And now we take you to Evangel Church in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Repeat this out loud with me. Father, as I open your word today, speak to me. May I have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and the courage to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, uh, you can begin to make your way. We're going to uh, land in two spots today. We're going to first go to Ephesians chapter 2, and then we're going to head our way over to uh, the book of Jeremiah, which is in the Old Testament. So you can kind of make your way there. And while you're doing that, let me give you a quick kind of update as to where we've been in this series in case you've missed a few weeks along the way. Uh, in week one, when we started this series, This Is Us, um, we shared with you after a season of prayer and fasting that, that the word that the Lord really deposited within our spirit for our church in this next season of ministry was the word transformation. And that God desires for our lives to be transformed, not just so that we become the, the beneficiaries of that. Yes, that happens. But, but also because he wants to transform the lives of others through our life. And um, we shared with you the new vision statement, which is, is really why we exist as a church as we began to head into this new season and why we exist as a church is to simply lead people into a transforming relationship with Jesus. That we want to be a church, that everything we do, that everything we're about is helping people experience that transformed life. And so in uh, week two, I shared with you uh, a little diagram that is the transformation process you know, my initial question when I hear we're supposed to be a church of transformation is how does that happen? And so it happens by these four steps, and we've got this diagram up here. The first step in all of our lives in order to experience transformation is we got to know God. Like, we got to know God. That is the foundational part. Like, you can, you can fast forward to all the other areas and all the other steps, but if you don't know God, then all the other stuff doesn't really make much sense. You see, we looked in scripture in that week and we discovered something pretty, pretty interesting. We discovered that there is a difference between a biblical knowledge and the knowledge that you and I are most accustomed to today. You see, in our society today, when uh, we hear the word, word no, we think of intellectual, we think of a head knowledge. But when you look in scripture and you look at this word no in scripture, that it's actually a word that was used to describe a committed relationship between a husband and a wife. And so the idea of knowing God isn't an intellectual knowledge, but it's a knowing deep in our heart. And it's the kind of knowing that is followed by commitment, that we make the decision to put God first in our life and, and we allow him to be the one that calls the shots. Does that mean we're perfect? Absolutely not. But it means that in our compass, that there's always a north, and the north isn't what we want. The north is what God wants. And then we talked about the second step. The second step is finding freedom. And, and we learned this. We learned that Jesus didn't just die on the cross to save us, which he did do that. But he also died on the cross to free us. And that God's desire for each and every one of us is not to be identified and not to live with the baggage of our past and the mistakes and, and, and the labels that people put on us, but it is for us to experience freedom. I mean, think about that. What would life be like if the thing that tends to be your biggest struggle in life wasn't there? Like imagine the freedom, imagine how God could use you, imagine the joy that would come in life if you could live a life of freedom. And, and we learned where that life of freedom comes from in scripture, that it's found where the spirit of God is. That scripture said that where the spirit is, there is freedom. That where the spirit resides, that it's in that place that we experience freedom. And what more of a reason for us to, to make church a, a something that is a priority in our life, to, to make the things of God a priority in our life, that we can't experience freedom in our life if, if he's second or third or fourth or way down on the list, that it's making him a priority. And then today, 
What I want to do is I want to unpack the third step in this process of how we experience transformation in our life. And this one today is really um, near and dear to my heart. It's something that I've personally walked through and I've experienced and I've experienced just the, the joy and, and the zeal for life. And, and, and as I've begun to discover what God's purpose was for my life, and I want to, I want to unpack that a little bit for you today. You know, one of my favorite quotes when I look back is from the 1800s, and it's from a guy named Samuel Clemens. You, you may know him from his pen name, Mark Twain. And Mark Twain made this statement. He said, he said this, that the two most important days in our life are the day that we were born and the day that we discover Why? The two most important days in our life are the day that we were born, the day that we discover why. You know, back in 2011, it was actually the year before God opened the door for Andrew and I to come to Evangel the first time. And we had made a decision to move from Florida up to Tennessee I had been in ministry, Andrea had been in ministry for almost 10 years at that point, and I just began to get this, this kind of, I don't know, desire in my heart to, to step out of ministry and to go into the business world. My parents owned a staffing agency in Tennessee, and they were kind of at that point in life where they were talking about retirement and what that looked like, and, and um, we began to kind of dream of what would it look like to, to go and to work with my parents with the idea of, of assuming leadership of, of the business when they retired. And, and so we moved, we prayed about it. And I don't know if you've ever experienced a, a situation like this where you pray about it and you feel like you've got peace and then you step into a season and, and all of a sudden it's like everything seems to go wrong. And for us, we prayed about it. We had peace. We followed where that peace led us, which was Tennessee. And we went there and I was there for a couple months and I just began to to, to, to experience these, these real lows emotionally. That we had taken this huge step of faith and moved our family up there with this dream of, of, of really allowing God to use us in the business world. And, and we get into that and it was just emotionally, it was, it was like this dark cloud was around me every day of my living there. And it was one day just in prayer that the Holy Spirit whispered this to me. He said, Ryan, I created you for ministry. He said, I created you for ministry. And it wasn't that going in the business world was bad, but I discovered something really important about my own life and my own journey that day. That God didn't create me for business, that he created me for ministry. And I learned something through that, through that season through that time where God taught me this valuable lesson that really radically changed my perspective on life. He taught me this, that before I had a pulse, that I had a purpose. Now think about this in your own life, in your own context, that before you had a pulse, God had a purpose for your life. Before you had a pulse, God had a purpose for your life. And here's Here's the important thing about this idea is that until you understand that whole dynamic, nothing else in your life will make sense. That nothing in your life will make sense unless you realize this valuable truth that God created you on purpose and for a purpose. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 2. And verse 10, and this is what it says. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. And I want to stop right there and I want to say this, that this word masterpiece in the original language is poema, and it means a work of art, that you are God's work of art. Like when you think of the greatest artists and those and the painters and all of those that at the time as they kind of step back and, and I've read some, 
some writings from them. And, and a lot of times what they do is they don't imagine what it looks like. They, they, they imagine kind of the pieces that don't belong. And so they begin to kind of color and, and to paint what they see in their head. And the whole idea that you are God's masterpiece, you are his work of art. And he says this, he says, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So when you made the decision to accept Christ and to surrender your life to him, scripture says that you were made anew, that no longer the old is there, it's passed away, but the new is here, that you and I are a new creature. Uh, creature. And why did God do that? He did it so that we could do the good things. Now look at this, that he planned for us long ago. Like he had a plan for your life long ago. And that part of your salvation experience wasn't just to receive eternal life, that it wasn't just to experience freedom, but it was also to discover your purpose. You see, your purpose preceded you. Think about that. Your purpose preceded you. It wasn't like God created you and then wondered, okay, what am I going to do with him and what am I going to do with her? Like, like, okay, he's made some bad mistakes. She's done some bad things in her life and, and, and and these things have, are kind of there. And so, so now I'm going to take into consideration all of those things and I'm going to figure out what's left for them to do for my kingdom. No. That God planned long ago a purpose for each and every one of our lives. And and here's what we've got to understand, that if our purpose preceded us, then when we pursue a life that's outside of that purpose, guess what happens? We began to, to get bored in life. We began to drift Spiritually, we begin to feel like something's missing. Have you ever felt that before in your life? Like, like, why am I here? Like, like there's got to be more to life than this. And so what I learned that day through this real season of discomfort where I felt like I was taking a step of faith and God was going to show up in a, in a crazy, mighty way. And I end up in that season and it was just miserable and it was down and my emotions were down that I discovered this, that life isn't really about pursuing a career, that life is more about pursuing a purpose. A whole life when we take a step back and We've got the dreams of, of money, the dreams of things, the dreams of a career path and success and nice houses and all that stuff. That what, what if we realize that that's not what life is really all about? That if we could just get a sense of what God's purpose is for our life, then all of those other things tend to, tend to kind of fall right into place. See, in high school, I played sports, and I, I, I experienced a couple different times dislocating my shoulders. I don't know if you've ever dislocated a joint in your body before, but it's not, it doesn't feel very good. Now, it feels good when they put it back into position, but it doesn't feel very good when it's out of place. And friend, when we're living our lives out of alignment with God's purpose for our lives, we feel it. Like we can sense it, like something just doesn't feel right. Look with me in the book of Jeremiah here in the Old Testament. There's this fascinating passage in Jeremiah chapter one. And, and these are God's words to Jeremiah about his purpose. And, and I think this statement applies to us as well. The Jeremiah says in chapter one, starting in verse four, that the word of the Lord came to me, this is Jeremiah speaking this, that the word of the Lord came to me, and, and he said this in verse five, that before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, think about that for a moment, that before your first moment in the womb of your mother, God knew you. And I wanna stop right here, and I wanna, I wanna kinda, I want, to, I want to make a statement 
that really would not, is not very politically correct in our culture today. But I want to make this statement as it relates to this passage that we're going to read so that you kind of understand where we stand as a church. You see, we will always be a church that's guided by the authority of the word of God, period. Culture changes, society changes, what's acceptable changes, what's unacceptable changes, but the word of God never changes. That there is an authority there that we are going to be a church that stands on the authority of the word of God. And as we see in scripture here that it tells us that, that there is life before life. Like there is life in the mother's womb, but God knew us even before that point. And so for us as a church, that we're always going to be a church that defends the unborn child at all costs, that we are going to be a church that recognizes that in the authority of God's word, that we're going to stand up to that. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't even matter what the courts say or what's cool or socially acceptable. That nothing for us as a church will persuade us or force us from budging from this position. However, I want you to know today that if you've walked through that in your own life, that if in your rearview mirror of life that you've made a decision to give up a child before, or maybe you're in that spot today and you're, you're trying to make a decision of what that looks like for you, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you and let you know that we serve a God that loves, that forgives. He doesn't forgive just some sins. He forgives all sins. And you're looking at a pastor right now that's standing up here, my own mother walked through this in her own life. That when she was a senior in high school, she gave up a child. I should have an older brother. And she was walking through a season and didn't know to her that was the right thing to do in the moment. And friend, I'll tell you this. To this day, she passed this past December. And to this day, I think that her struggle and journey with drugs and alcohol and in and out in prison and all that stuff was a direct result of her inability that God forgave her, but her inability to be able to let that go. And she found those things as, as something that helped her to be able to cope with, with that pain. And so if you're walking through a season like that or you're faced with a decision like that, reach out to us. Don't go through life alone. This isn't a place of condemnation that although we are going to stand on the authority of God's word, we're not going to stand on it with our fingers pointed, but we're going to stand on it with the love of God with our arms wide and extended. And so friend, if you are dealing with that, email us, mail at evangelag.org, one of our prayer team, or somebody will follow up with you and touch base and, 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 and help walk you through that. Or you can pray with one of our team members up here in the front after the service today. But we see, we see Jeremiah began to unpack this in verse five, and he says, before I formed you in the womb, God said, I knew you. Before you were born, look at this, that I set you apart, that I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Listen, I believe these words aren't just for Jeremiah, but for, they're for you and I today, that before God formed us, he knew us. I mean, think about that. Before God formed us, he knew us. In other words, before you chose God, God chose you. Before you chose God, God chose you. That before you were even born, that he set aside, he set you aside for a specific purpose, that God was making preparations for your future before you even breathed your first breath. And I think that's why the psalmist said in Psalm 139, verse 13, he says that you made all the delicate, all the inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. You can see an act here of an artist, an act, you are his piece 
of art, his work of art. And before you even realized that in your mother's womb that he was putting you together, knitting you together for that very purpose that he's deposited inside of you. We see here that 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 was for Jeremiah and they're true for us, but I want you to see this. I want you to see Jeremiah's response in this next verse because I think it's classic. I think it's a response that each one of us has had in our own life. That Jeremiah says, alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak that I'm too young. God's saying, I've set you apart, I've appointed you to the nations. And Jeremiah's response to that is, I don't know how to speak and I'm too young. I mean, think about all the excuses that we make in our lives for not being able to carry out or to walk out God's purpose for our life. I think about my own journey and I think about when God began to reveal his purpose and his plan in my life. And and I had two things for me in my life that I used as excuses that would disqualify me for being and doing what God had called me to be. One of them I shared a few weeks ago that it was the fear of public speaking. (laughs) That in college I'd rather write a 20 page paper than to have to get up and give a two minute presentation. And so for me, the excuse was, God, I can't do that. I can't do that. I'm too nervous. I'm too much of an introvert. And you know what my other one was? My learning disability. God, I can't be one that gets up and presents the, the word of God and the gospel to other people. I've got a learning disability. I struggle to be able to remember things. For me in my own life and my own journey, the doctor said that as a kid that I've got to read something seven times in order to comprehend it, equivalent to somebody else who's normal that reads it once. And so for me in my life, I had my own excuses and my own disqualifications and my guess is in your journey, you've had the same thing. That maybe you felt the Lord just kind of stirring your heart towards a certain direction or certain step and and you had your reasons of why you can't do that. And what I love here about Jeremiah's response is it helps us to see that, that even people in the Bible doubted their ability to do what God had called him to do. I mean, think about it. Think about how many times in your life that you've thrown in the towel because you've thought about, you know, you're not good enough or you thought about the labels of your past or you thought about the mistakes that you had made. I mean, when you look at scripture, think about this reality that Jacob was a cheater, that Peter had a bad temper, that David had an affair, that Noah got drunk, that Jonah ran from God, that Paul was a murderer, that Gideon was insecure, that Miriam was a gossip, that Martha was a worrier, that Thomas was a doubter, that Sarah was impatient, that Elijah was moody, that Moses stuttered, that Zacchaeus was short, that Abraham was old, and well, Lazarus, he was dead. Friend, we've all made excuses. We've all initially come up with reasons why we can't do what God has designed us to do. And that's why I love 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where Paul says this. He says that my grace, speaking of God's grace, that it is sufficient for you, meaning it's all you need. Like his grace upon your life is all you need. Like his grace upon your life is not just for the mistakes and the faults that you made in your past, but his grace upon your life is to empower you for his purpose for your life. And it says that my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Friend, I've learned this firsthand in my own life. That if I'm doing something that I think I'm good at, who gets the credit for that? I do. But when I allow myself to be in alignment with God's will and his purpose for my life, he's always going to stretch me in areas that are a little bit uncomfortable, that that's part of being in alignment with his will. And what we see here is that as we live that out in our life, 
as we allow him to work through us, even in areas of our life that we seem insufficient or insignificant or not worthy enough, that he is the one that gets the credit in those moments. I think back in my own journey, I think back in my own step of faith in college when I changed my major from sports medicine to pastoral ministries. And that's a story in and of itself because I pass out when I see blood. So how in the world I would have been able to go into sports medicine, I have no idea. But I changed my major to pastoral ministries as I began to sense the Lord calling me into ministry and and it was a step of faith for me. I mean, I got a D in my preaching class. And some of you guys are like, no wonder that explains a lot. But, but Jeremiah, just like, just like you and me, that we see here in this moment that, that he comes up with his excuses of why, why he can't fulfill God's purpose for his life. And I want you to see what God says in verse 7. It says, but the Lord said to me, don't say I'm too young. Don't say it. In other words, Jeremiah, stop disqualifying yourself from, from becoming the person that I've designed you to be. Now watch this next point because I think it's really important that he says, you must go to everyone that I send you to and say whatever I command you. God says, don't say that you're young, don't be disqualifying yourself, but go to everyone that I send you to and say whatever I command you to say. And I want you to notice something in that verse, something that I think is really important about our purpose in life, that God commanded Jeremiah to go before he felt any different about his disqualifications. God commanded Jeremiah to go before he felt any different about his disqualifications. In other words, God didn't work and then Jeremiah went, but Jeremiah went and then God began to work. Friend, our journey to discovering our purpose in life is a lot like an onion, that it's, it's revealed in our life in layers and a lot of times what we do is we sit back and we wait and, and we want the entire, the entire picture before we take a step towards what God has for our life. And the reality is, is it doesn't happen that way. But if we constantly pull back and wait for the perfect picture, that we will miss out on God's purpose for our lives. That I've experienced it in my own journey and you'll experience it in yours. That it is one step at a time. That the picture of what God wants for you and your life is revealed one step at a time, not all at once. And that as you're faithful in that step, as he prods you in your heart and begins to stir and you begin to sense like, like maybe I need to get involved in this ministry or maybe I need to serve in this area or maybe I need to be a part of a small group or whatever it is, as that begins to stir in your heart, that it is one step that God begins to show that that was him speaking and you begin to experience a new dimension of his work in your life and then he begins to stir another step and you take the step and another step and you take the step and then before long you begin to look back and you see a progression of step after step after step after step and you begin to see that what God created you for, that his very purpose in your life that everything that he was at work at creating and, and putting together before you were even born, that, that he had it in mind. And that he knows what's in you more than you know what's in you. You know, it makes me think of this verse in Psalm 119, verse 105. And the psalmist says that your word is a lamp to guide my feet. That your word is a lamp to guide my feet. My feet. I don't know if you've ever been camping before, but I know I wish that God would give us a flashlight where we could see into the future, right? But he gives us a lamp. 
And what does a lamp do? It illuminates a couple steps at a time. When you're using a lamp in the darkness, you can't see way down the road, but you can see the step right in front of you. And we see in God's word that as we begin to experience his purpose, that it is one step at a time. But what I love about this passage of scripture is in verse eight, we see this amazing promise that God gives each and every one of us if we will live our lives that way. He says, don't be afraid of them. Look at this, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Friend, what a better promise is there that as we are faithful and we begin to take steps towards our purpose, that, that we will experience the blessing of God's presence and the blessing of God's power and the blessing of God's protection and the blessing of God's provision in our life. You know, several years ago, Jeremiah, not this Jeremiah, but my son Jeremiah went to a men's conference in Washington. And one of the speakers was Steve Zakani, and he's a famous Seattle Sounders soccer player. And he shared the story in one of the services that moved me so much. He shared the story about this tiny village in the Congo. This really rich guy had decided to, to buy this magnificent grand piano and to, to have it shipped to this village in the Congo. This grand piano had played in orchestras all across the world. And that package arrives to this little village and guess what? Nobody knew what it was. That nobody could figure it out. Nobody could figure what the purpose of it was. The village elder comes walking in. He's known as the smartest person in all the village. And, and he looks at that magnificent grand piano that had been in orchestras all over the world that had played some of the most famous, amazing pieces. And he looks at it. And the light bulb moment goes off in his head. And he says, I know what it is. It's a doorstop. And for two years, this magnificent grand piano played all over the world, sat in a room in a small village in the Congo, propping open a door so that those that walked in and out didn't have to open and close the door. You know, a couple years after that, this gentleman that sent the piano showed up to this village and he was utterly amazed that he looks at the grand piano over in the corner propping open a door and he's like what are you doing he says this thing wasn't made to stop doors this thing was made to make music and friend I wonder how many of us in our own lives how many of us spend our entire lives stopping doors when God made us to make music? Friend, don't live the rest of your life without discovering the very reason for your existence. That God has a purpose for you. And we are committed here at Evangel to helping you discover what that is. Ultimately, I think the challenge to you and to me is the same challenge that God gave to Jeremiah in that moment. One simple word, go. Go. Friend, what is it in your life that you've sensed the Holy Spirit stirring? Are you in a season in your life where it just feels like there's a disconnect? It just feels like 
you're living a life, you're doing life. Some of you may even have a good life, but what's my purpose? Like if God knew me before I was even formed in my mother's womb and if God created me for good works that he planned long ago, what are those good works? Friend, don't live the rest of your life propping up doors when God created you to make music. Would you bow your head with me this morning and close your eyes? Father, we, Lord, we thank you that you are an awesome God. We thank you, Father, that there is no carbon copy of us on planet Earth now and there never has been. That, Father, you've created each and every one of us on purpose and for purpose. Lord, I pray over my friends that are here in person. I pray over those that are watching online. God, I pray that, Lord, this week they would begin to, to feel and sense a shifting in their life. But, Father, if they, don't, if they don't sense that they're in stride with your purpose, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy that no matter what mistakes we've made, no matter how many times we've fallen short, no matter what labels we put on ourselves or others put on us, God, they don't disqualify us from your purpose. Father, I pray for those mothers today God, in the past, have, have made a decision to abort their child. God, I come against condemnation. Lord, I come against those decisions haunting them and keeping them from all that you have for them. Lord, we know that precious little child is with you today. God, I pray that that sweet mother in this moment would receive your love and your grace. Friend, in this moment, with every head bowed and eye closed, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to say this to you. that you can't walk in God's purpose for your life until you truly know him. That your purpose is activated in that moment that you receive him as Lord and Savior in your life. Don't live another day on your own. Don't live another day where you're calling the shots for your own life. Today could be the day that everything begins to turn around in your life. If that's you, if you're here in this room, you can just, if today you're kind of sensing that the Lord's saying today is the day to get it right. Maybe you've drifted away or maybe you've never asked him to come into your heart before, that I want to lead you in a quick but important prayer, the most important prayer you'll ever pray you're in this room, you can just kind of slip up your hand. You can put it back down. If you're watching online right there where you're at, just as a step of, of faith and boldness, I want, you to, I want you to even lift your hand at home and pray this with me. Father, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for living life my way. Today, I choose you Come live inside of me. Help me to be the person that you've created me to be. Lord, today I choose you and I put you first. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church family, would you congratulate those that have prayed that prayer today, those here in person and those watching online. Listen, I tell you, 
Living a transformed life is the most amazing journey that you will ever walk in your entire life. Today, before we go, I want to give you an opportunity to be able to to give this morning. You'll see a a slide up on the screen, four ways to, or ways to be able to give. You know, I was thinking this morning, I was reminded of this verse in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23, that tells us that the purpose of tithing is to teach us to put God first in our lives. I don't know about you, but I can, I can use that reminder from time to time. I think so many times we put ourselves first, we put our future first, we, we put our relationships first. But we can't experience God's best for our life until we take a step back and we put God first in our life. And that also includes our finances. Well, would you stand with me today? We're gonna sing one more song, but I wanna pray over our giving. If you're here in person and and you're not giving online, you can give in one of the black boxes on the walls as your way out. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence here today. We thank you for your word. Lord, we want to be a people, God, that lives in alignment with your purpose. So, Father, speak to us this week. Father, I pray that you would bless our giving today. Lord, may we use it to impact the lives of those around us. In Jesus' name. We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel's all about making the name of Jesus famous and his church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life.